the next speaker is Eduard Sabido, um, and um, he's the head of the protomics uh, unit in uh, CRG, um, as well as the University Pompeo Fabro. Uh, so, and today he's going to present us uh, uh, a very interesting topic, translation protomics, and uh, uh, the word for the speaker. Okay, well, thanks, thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm indeed Edward Sabido, so I'm the head of the proteomics unit here at CRG and University Pompeo Fabra. And it has been a real honor for us to be local co-organizers of, uh, of this course and, and to be able to host in our institution the 10th anniversary of the Max Quant Summer School. So I hope you are enjoying this, this course. I, I wish you a very, a very pleasant and exciting scientific week. And so our laboratory is located in the same building. So this is the building of uh, the scientific, well, the, the park for biomedical research in Barcelona. And well, you, 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 oops, you have already seen it in, in the coffee breaks. And this park together with other research institutes, research infrastructures, hospitals and universities within Barcelona have made our city one of the hottest spots for biomedical research in Europe. And it's within this context in which our proteomics unit actually has been collaborating a lot with these other research institutes and hospitals in translational proteomics, in, in translational proteomics projects. And during the last years, what we have done is actually we have adapted many of our sample preparation protocols to be able to process formaldehyde fixed para paraffin and BEP samples and also different types of liquid biopsies like serum, plasma, urine, or, or CSF. And what I want to show today, or what I would like to share with you, it's one, of, one example of these translational uh, proteomics projects that we do. So we have several collaborations and ongoing projects. But most importantly, also all the different questions or, or problems that arise uh, more from the analytical point of view, from the proteomics part and the mass spectrometry part, and how we try to tackle these questions and offer answers to the community. So, our first project is uh, the diagnostic of multiple sclerosis. So in this project, we team up with the reference center for multiple sclerosis here in Catalonia. And as you know, multiple sclerosis is a neurodegenerative disease of the central nervous system in which there is the destruction of, of myelin in the axons of neurons. And this actually produces a distorted messages. So the, the signal is not tr transduced well through the neurons and this creates an impairment of, 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 signal, of signaling and therefore severe, uh, uh, severe problems in the phenotype of these patients. So what we know um, is that patients that go to, to this reference center and the hospital in Barcelona, so there are some patients that actually have one, well, they go to the hospital because they have uh, a, a symptom, right, which might be related to this disease. And what we know is and that by protocol, when they arrive the first time in the, in, the, in the hospital, what they have is they collect one CSF sample, and then also they enter a monitoring process. And then what we want to know is that during these years of monitoring, five, ten years, uh, eventually we know that some patients actually remained healthy because this was a clinically isolated syndrome, whereas others have several relapses and eventually developed multiple sclerosis. So the question here is whether in the first day sample of CSF, was there enough information to actually uh, do a risk assessment and prediction of whether this patient would eventually develop multiple sclerosis. So for this, we apply normally or we combine discovery proteomics, either shotgun proteomics or data-independent proteomics, and I will, and I will come uh, to this later in the talk, and also, with, and also target the proteomics. And in this case, what we did is we selected 24 proteins from former uh, data sets, discovery data sets that we, we acquired in our, in our laboratory. This, this included different isoforms and splicing variants and also natural polymorphisms occur, occur in, the, in the population. And we set up an SRM assay in the, uh, in the triple quadrupole of, uh, of, of SIEX. And, and then what we measured is different, different type of patients, so 25 patients of, of, of the different categories and one, out, 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 well, one, one normal or control group outside the, the experiment. So for each of these targeted peptides, what we had is the, is the endogenous sample and also the heavy, or the heavy peptide or isotopically labeled peptide signal. And for each of all the analytes, 
also a reference MS2 spectra. So for, with this, we were able to quant do relative quantification in all the different 73 patients. This is data, so this is retention time. This is uh, patients, you, you see a drift of plus minus one minute, more or less, which is normal in, in this type of liquid biopsies. And with this quantification data, then we started doing the, the statistical approach to select the best protein combinations that actually could predict or assess the risk of doing or developing multiple sclerosis. So here what we do is we take our data set, we, we make a partition of our data set, we have a training and a validation, then we use the training set to develop a logistic regression model so that we can select one protein from all of them that have the best prediction, predicting uh, score. Right? And then we repeat this for a second protein, so that we only add the second protein if it adds more classification power, and so on and so forth. Right? And we repeat this partition of training and validation 500 times, so that we can iterate through this. And at the end, what we see is that through this 100 times, there are some protein combinations that show up recurrently. Right? So for example, this one appeared almost in one-fifth or more or in over one-fifth of, of the results. So for each of them, therefore, we have the rock curves, not only the rock curves of, of for each of them, but also the associated variability depending on which patients of the core we take into account. Right? And this is very important for us. And it's also very important for us not only to stay at this level on saying, well, this protein combination is good or bad, but also to do risk assessment heat maps. Right? And these are this type of, of heat maps in which colors are probability or risk assessment of developing, in this case, multiple sclerosis. So the axes are the endogenous abundance of each of the proteins involved in, in the prediction signature. So that, <coughs> so that given one sample, we can measure these two analytes. We can know the coordinates based on the abundance of analyte one and analyte two, and then assign a risk assessment score for that particular patient. And so this might be very preliminary, but it's something in which medical doctors actually can, can make some actions. So in this type of translational projects in which we have large cohorts, and, and yesterday, so Professor Mann was, was also showing the, the capability of, of measuring a lot of samples in very short times, but the reality is that projects will not go shorter, but actually we will measure more samples. And instead of measuring dozens or hundreds of samples, we will go probably to, to hundreds or, or thousands of samples. And within this context for us, and we realized this very early soon when we started this type of project, it's very, it's very important to actually control all the, all the process of the sampling, right? So from sample extraction, sample digestion, also how our instruments are performing, and then have reproducible data analysis workflows. And so we have been assessing each of these steps and putting internal controls for each of them. And what I want to talk now briefly is about how we control the performance of our LCMS system. So what we did here is actually we collected all the quality control parameters that we, didn't be, we did not define, but actually that are consensus among the community and have been defined by uh, international initiatives like the Proteomics Standard Initiative from, from UPOR, the National Institute of, of Standards. And then, so we collect it so that we can monitor all these quality control, control parameters in with the goal to actually reduce the variance, increase the robustness, and increase the reproducibility of our workflows. But many of us have already done these efforts of doing quality control assessment or of our instruments, and what it happens, or at least what happened to us at the very beginning, is that having five instruments, injecting several quality control samples per day, we end up with lots of raw files to be analyzed, right? And this was actually very labor intensive data collection and also data analysis, and which at the end of the day, actually we didn't do. And this generated incomplete data sets of quality control. And then also another problem in this type of data is subjective evaluation, right? So we were internally discussing in the lab whether the instrument was performing good or bad and not having clear cutoff on when to stop and clean the instrument. And finally, there are also some technical limitations on how to automate these quality control things uh, in the lab every, for, for every day. So our, our 
uh, dream system would be one that has automatic capabilities, that has effortless data collection, is, has also the availability, availability, um, the ability to provide objective evaluation, and then, of course, we would like a user interface. And this is why we developed the QCloud, which is a cloud-based quality control system for longitudinal quality control of, of, of LCMS instrumentation. And this is based on, on a thin client that we installed in the LCMS system that actually um, so recognize all the Q quality control uh, Raw files in this case, based on, on a regex, a regular expression, and then after after authentication and authorization, so this pushes uh, all the quality control data or all the quality control raw files into our uh, into our cloud quality control cloud system. So once there, we didn't invent the reinvent the wheel, but actually we took advantage of other other pieces of software like MS Convert or OpenMS, so that we automated all the pipeline of data processing. So this is pushed into the cloud, then it's converted to open standards, and then through different OpenMS workflows, actually we extract all the quality control parameters, we inject them in a MySQL database, and then we, we display this on a website and a user-friendly interface. And currently, QCloud supports both ID-free and ID-based proteomics proteomics workflows. And this is what the users see. Actually, this is the dashboard of our, of our own lab. So here you have the four instruments that we have registered at the moment in our system. So it has several parameters, like for example, total number of proteins or peptides identified in, in HeLa samples, and also peptide areas of these different selected peptides for VSA, which is another one of the other quality controls that we have beyond beyond HILA, and then also in this interface, we can actually annotate each, pot, each spot or data, data point with different annotations, for example, to, to be able to know when we calibrated the instrument, when we cleaned the instrument, what was the cause of a failure, and so on and so forth, so that we, at the end of the year, we, don't not on, we, we, only, we have not only quality control data, but quality control annotated data that we can remind and take actions on how to improve our systems. So the system has also other parameters, of course, LC-related parameters like peak width and retention time, MS-related parameters, so here I'm showing two of them, injection time and mass accuracy, and, and here are some quality control evaluations of our own instruments. So here, for example, these are the peptide areas. You can see a charging effect, so this can be seen even clearer here, which is a summary plot of all these peptides, how the signal of peptide intensity is going out of control at some point. So here, when it overcomes the threshold, so we stop the instrument, we clean, we calibrate, and we are back on shape again. Something more subtle is this case uh, that we had some months ago on mass accuracy. So you can see that we had a mass accuracy within the range of 1 ppm in our orbit trap fusion LUMOS. At some point, we did an intervention, a maintenance, and then this was, this was the new mass accuracy. You can see an increased variability. Importantly, most of the data points here are within the 2 ppm threshold. So, without, so let's say without this type of plots and graphical representation, we would not have seen that this would have been a problem, right? So this allowed us to take some action. So we, we recalibrated the instrument, and then we were back again on shape. So we currently modified and adapted QCloud to support multi-site and multi-instruments. So this means that any, any laboratory can register their own own on mass spectrometers, their own lab, and, and have a ready-to-use quality control system. So currently, we, we have over 40 instruments, 14, well, around 40 instruments in the, in, the, in the system already registered, including several laboratories within, within Europe, especially within the Alliance of Core for Life. And as I said, so QCloud is open to everyone. It's a single it's an easy three-step ready-to-use quality control system in which anyone can register. So here is the URL. Then you need to download the QCrawler, which is this small piece of software that actually pushes the quality controls into the, into the system. And then, of course, you have to remember to put your quality control data, or, well, vials into, into the autosampler. And then all the quality control parameters are displayed on the website for you. So beyond quality control data, in, 
in these translational projects, we are also aware of other more, uh, let's say, fundamental questions. And one of them is, for example, what peptides to use for protein quantification. And this has been partially addressed this, more, well, or this afternoon by, by Jürgen and, and other speakers on which pep, whether we use unique peptides, razor peptides, all of them, and, and how the different algorithms use, well, can use this different information. So the truth is that beyond the use of unique peptides or even razor peptides, there are many rules in the community about using or not using peptides with miscleavage, with, uh, for example, varying amino acids like methionine or histidine or, or tryptophan that can go, undergo secondary reactions. And the truth is that there are so many rules so many, so few peptides. And if you apply all the rules of not selecting uh, these certain peptides for quantitation, at some point you, you run out of, of, of peptides. So in our lab, what we, we thought is, well, how important is this? And is this really true, right? And for this, what we did is we downloaded the 11 um, cell line, cell line, um, data set from, from Mann's lab that at some point was one of the most downloaded and reused data sets in, in the community, and we calculated all the fold changes with, of each protein for different, for different cell lines. And here you can see, for example, for one particular protein, there were several peptides here, so we calculated the log two fold change. Of course, it's the same, because actually this is the log fold change for the protein. And then we calculated the log fold change according to each peptide, right? So, and then we, based on the delta log fold change, based on, on peptide and protein, we classified and ranked these peptides according to being this peptide the best peptide that represents the protein fold change. So this fold change is the closer to the protein fold reported fold, so to the protein reported log fold change, and so on until the last one, which would mean that if you use this peptide, you would actually be very off on the real or a less consensus log two fold change of the protein level. So these are examples on plotting. So this is the delta log two fold change between the protein and the peptide. Of course, the first so the best peptides are centered to zero, and the last and others are much worse, right? And the same happens for another comparison. So, and then we ask, well, how does the rules apply to all these peptides? And what we plot is the, is the number of peptides that, for example, contains tryptophan. And we said, how many peptides that contains tryptophan are in the, in the, among the best peptides for quantification, and how many are among the worst ones? And we did this within one comparison and another comparison here, and not only for tryptophan, but actually for all the, let's say, the common rules that we as a community more or less agree that we should avoid selecting those peptides for quantitation. And our surprise actually is that, well, so having or selecting a peptide that contains, for example, histidine or not selecting it, it doesn't matter much because there are so many peptides containing histidine being the best peptides for quantitation, as there are among the worst ones. So the conclusion here was actually that the rules do not stand really, uh, except probably about this unique uniqueness, uh, the uniqueness uh, feature, and that for protein quantitation, especially for targeted proteomics in which you select one or two peptides per protein, so probably you need to do some uh, preliminary studies on and identify which are the peptides that are the best proxies for protein quantitation, which would me mean to identify those peptides that are quantotypic. Another is to use as many peptides as possible, as, for example, Jürgen was suggesting before. And this is because the more information you have, normally there is, there is a better estimate when using the mean or the median on the protein fold change. And this would mean uh, or would be the concept related to the, the, wisdom of, uh, the wisdom of the crowds. So another thing that we are also interested or that relates to what peptides to use in protein quantification is what I call la disparition or, or peptide stability. And many of you that have, for example, done these translational 
project, proteomics projects that run over weeks, right? So these are, this is the same peptide. So probably you have observed something like this. So this is the same peptide in several days. And from here to here, there is one month of acquisition. And what you can see is that the, this peptide signal actually is decreasing every time until it's almost disappeared. So, and this means that actually this peptide probably it's not very stable, and you don't want to use this peptide for protein quantitation. So we sat, or we, we sat in our lab and started wondering how many of these peptides exist in, 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 in the normal proteins that we are we are measuring. And so to start as a proof of concept, we selected this ABRF consensus, consensus sample that contains 1,000 stable isotope label of synthetic peptides that match to over five proteins that are conserved across rat, mouse, and human. And then we measured them twice a week during over or over one month. And then what we saw is that some peptides uh, so this is the area under the curve for each of these peptides are quite stable. So this is the variability that we can normalize based on several normalization algorithms. But other peptides actually behave like this. And actually, again, so this is not something that you would like to use for quantitation. So next step, once we have the proof of concept, is let's, well, let's do this for the whole human proteome. So we, we team up with Bernard Kuster, and we, we had... Uh, or we were a bit, uh, we had access to 95,000 treated peptides in pools of 96 of 1,000 peptide sheets for SRM Atlas, and also over 1,000 treated peptides from the Proteo tools that was developed uh, and has been has been synthesized by the group of Bernard Kuster. So what we have done is we have been measuring all this this over 1,000 peptides plus the other 1,000 peptides over several weeks and months. And now what we have is all the stability information for all triptych peptides of the human proteome. And not only this, but now we have enough information also to start relating the physicochemical properties of the sequence of peptides to actually the stability of each of them. And all this data, so we will, make public, we will make it publicly available, probably through ProteomeDB or Proteome Tools, so that whenever you go there for, for a reference spectra or a triptych peptide information for a certain protein, you will not only have all the, the reference information, but also the stability. And then you will be able to decide whether you want to use that peptide for quantification or not. So another thing again, related to protein quantitation, is that we, don't, we want not only to be able to quantify peptides and proteins as, uh, as reliable as possible, but also we want to achieve automated, accurate, and precise peptide quantification. So to be, to be able to make it as independent as possible from the sample and from the operator. So when we do in this case, again, in targeted proteomics protein quantitation. So we have, for example, here, we have the signal in, of the heavy peptide, so the reference uh, isotopically labeled peptide. So in the red, we would have the endogenous. We can do a ratio here for, protein quantitation, for peptide quantitation and, ex well, and try to deduce the amount of, of endogenous analyte based on the, our reference. But we know that this to be accurate and precise, the best is that this is one-to-one -one and that so that the concentration of heavy and endogenous peptide is more or less one-to-one -one and within the linear range. But what happens is that even though we make great efforts to try to match the one-to-one -one ratio for, for each peptide, what happens is that we for example, in this case, we optimize this ratio here for that particular peptide and that particular sample. But when we go for the same peptide in another sample, so different, slightly different matrix because it comes from another patient, so here we lost this. And actually, for example, so this is a battery of over 100 patients. So in blue, you have the, the reference synthetic peptides in... in in, in red, so you have the endogenous abundance of here. So this means that if we want to have one-to-one -one ratios, so we should be able to, to optimize each of these ratios for each particular sample. So we thought how we could do this, and our, our, our approach to this is actually, so, and what we have done is 
maybe it's too dark here, but so this is the light light peptide, and then what we what, what we are doing, and this we are doing only for very advanced and uh, translational projects in which we are very sure or we have high confidence of the, on the analytes that we are measuring, is that we use different isotopes, each of them a different concentration, and each of them having a slightly different mass, because we, for example, here, we not only label the arginine, but also many other, many other amino acids within the sequence. So that here we can have a delta mass of two, six, or, or even more daltons from one sequence to the other. So then we have this scale of of abundances, and then we can actually know exactly which is the, the endogenous sample. So this is the theory. How does data look like? So data look like this. So this is the extracted ion chromatograms for each of these isotopologs. So this would be the different, the different concentrations of each of them. And then we can always fit a regression curve here and actually quantify this either using the regression fit or with the closest isotopolog concentration. So it's a way that we can do this independently on, on the sample or the, or on the sample and the peptide amount in each sample. Not only this, but actually we can also automate the linear range uh, detection. So for example, having these five data points as, as reference sample, so we can computationally say, well, the linear range spans all five data points, or only spans four data points. So if I have a sample with endogenous amount here, I will be able to retrieve a proper quantitation. If I have something here, probably I will have to report a, an NA or a missing value. So what we are using this is actually as a robust method for error quantification in formal day uh, fixed para paraffin embedded patient samples of ER2 positive and HER2 negative uh, patient samples. Okay, so uh, so the last part of, of my talk, I would like to go back to the screening proteomics, and as I said, so we are combining both shotgun and data-independent acquisition, and the more type or the more translational projects we do, the more uh, data-independent acquisition we are using. And as you may know, and it has also been introduced in this course, so data-independent uh, uses these broadband windows in which there are isolation of, for example, 25 Dalton. So all the precursors here are uh, co-isolated, co-fragmented, and, and recorded in one single spectra. So what we have then, it's a series of, of this broadband that covers the whole mass range, and then they start again, and so on. So we have cycles of going from 400 to 13 or 1,350, and then we start again, and we get this complex, complex MS2 spectra from which we can extract the MS2 fragment extracted IO chromatograms and have these coelution profiles in which we can identify the peptides and quantify the peptides of interest. There are also other implementations of DIA or data-independent acquisition schemes. For example, there is the MSX DIA isolation scheme. Instead of using these sequential windows, what they do, and this was developed by Macos at, uh, in Seattle, so they have these four Dalton windows, and they multiplex five Dalton, so four, five windows of four Dalton within the mass range that they select randomly. Right, so in the first window, they will have these five isolation segments. In the second window, they will have another randomly choose five isolation segments, and for the third, and so on and so forth. So at the end, what they have is composite windows, co uh, four of 20, in total, 20 M over Z, or Daltons, in which we ha they have five different isolation segments. So whenever there is a precursor isolated, then they have we have the signals of the MS2. So, what, what we have been developing to try to improve these uh, isolation schemes is actually not selecting uh, these, these MS2 I isolation fragments uh, at the MS2 level by at random, but actually multiplexing in, in windows. So, so this means that, for example, we are using this five Dalton window, and here we assume, for example, all all precursors with a charge three, so their equivalent at charge two will be within this 
this segment here. And if there are precursors with charge 3 in this segment, their precursors at charge 2 will be, will be here. Right? So, and we do this and for, for this, this masses here or this mass range here, and then we advance through the whole mass range. So here we have, instead of 20 Dalton windows, so we have these 23.75 Daltons of composite windows of three different segments. And then whenever there is a precursor isolated, so we are co-detecting the, uh, the MS2 signal from the plus two of fragments coming from plus two and plus three precursor. So there will be common fragments in here and this will sum up and increase the signal to noise ratio. And then there will be also fragments that are exclusive of the plus three and exclusive or of, the plus four, of the plus two precursor. So what we gain here are two things. One is a better signal to noise. Second is a better sequence coverage. And this compares, so here it's a comparison of the real signal of, of this data of this data, comparing our method that we call DIA plus or DIA charge because it combines these different charge states of different precursors. You can see the MS1, also the MS2. And this does not mean that this signal is not also in our control, in our control method, which is exactly the same but without this charge combination or with other, other methods, classical methods in DIA, like the 2020, so 20 windows of 20 Daltons or 32 windows of 25,000. So the signal is there, but actually the, the signal itself, the quality of the signal is so bad that automatic algorithms like, for example, the umpire are not able to, to identify this as a proper peptide. So when we analyze this data, what we have is that the number of, fragment, uh, uh, of fragments uh, of peptide, well, peptide fragments that are matched um, in charge one and charge four that are not multiplex. So it remains the same between our DIA plus method and our control method. Whereas for plus two and plus three charges that are multiplex, we see a gain on the number of fragments that are matched in, in the DIA plus method. The same happens for peptide profit probabilities. So it, they increase significantly for charge two and charge three. And this, of course, the, the end of the story or the conclusion of this is that actually this renders a significant increase on, on the amount of identified peptides over 30, or around 35,000 in, in two hour gradient and a significant amount of identified protein groups at 1% FDR at the protein level. So with this, I want to close up and summarize. So I explained you one of the, the translational projects that we, we are doing in our lab on diagnostic of multiple sclerosis. We all, I also went through the, our um, longitudinal assessment of quality control system for, for mass spectrometry, how we are quite focused on, on whether rules apply and how to choose peptides for pep protein quantitation, either by sequence, stability, or automation for, or automated for uh, automated protocols for accurate and precise quantitation. And finally, so this DIA plus new, new, and finally this new DIA plus isolation scheme that we have developed to boost the signal and increase the number of identifications for screening proteomics. So, and with this, so I would like to thank all our collaborators. So in this case, for example, people from the reference center for for multiple sclerosis, people from Northeastern University, uh, like Mina Choi and Olga Bitek, all our colleagues from core for life I listed here some, some of them, all funding bodies, and a special thanks to all the people from, from our unit. So today I explain, uh, the, so there is Christina, that is in the audience also. So she was in charge of the peptide stability, peptide quantification, quantification and the isotopologues. So these are projects that she led together with, with Amanda and Olga. Then there is also Eva Burras, that is, she's also in the, <coughs> in the audience. And she was um, conducting the experiments for multiple sclerosis and also she's, she's the inventor of DIA+. And finally, so Rouget and, and Daniel, who is not in the who is not in the picture, but also is in the audience, who have developed all the computational framework for QCloud. Thanks a lot for your attention.
Okay, yeah, very nice. Am I on? I think so. Yeah, so congratulations on this uh, DA plus. I think it's a very clever idea, and that's how one should do it. So it's, mm. it's, it's very good. And then for your, uh, so I know some labs are, are now uh, um, adopting your quality control mm -hmm. framework, including in Copenhagen. And my question is, is it on GitHub? Can you extend it? Okay, so all the code is on GitHub. Um, so we are also, so every, all the code is open source. All the code is on GitHub. Now we are working on shaping in a way uh, that other people can contribute to, to different models and also that other people can do local installations if they want. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question regarding the biomarker quantification. Um, the picture you showed uh, with HER2 classified, uh, HER2 positive and HER2 negative uh, breast cancer samples, and there were, was some disagreement between the mass spec data and the histology, so yes. my provocative question, who is wrong? <laughs> well, this, so this is part of the project, right? So see whether, uh, how, the, or, so what we see is that there is discrepancy between them. So what we are trying is also with the isotopologs to, to be able to provide re reliable quantitation of all these patients. Thanks. And more questions? So um, I have a question regarding the uh, peptide stability. So if some peptides are not stable over time, um, in, in under which condition were this peptide? So, for example, if you if you give your samples to a proteomics core facility the, on stage tips, for example, and the peptides stay there for two months because because the facility is busy, is I mean yes. this is okay, quite so, a problem then, right? I mean this is a very relevant question. So, what we did in here is uh, stability on auto sampler. Right? So meaning that everything was under control, and then at some point samples have to be in the auto sampler. And so we want to check the, the life in the auto sampler, whether during this lifetime peptides are stable or not. Okay. Thank you. And any more questions? Okay, thank you, Eduard, once more. <laughs>